She went out. Mitya was calm and even looked more cheerful, but only for a moment. He felt more and more oppressed by a strange physical weakness. His eyes were closing with fatigue. The examination of the witnesses was at last over. They proceeded to a final revision of the protocol. Mitya got up, moved from his chair to the corner by the curtain, lay down on a large chest covered with a rug, and instantly fell asleep. He had a strange dream, utterly out of keeping with the place and the time. Well, welcome to books 9 and 10 of the Brothers Karamazov. And as you just heard me read, I was giving you the prelude to Mitya's dream. And this is a very important segment that we read. And I hope that you enjoyed it and it filled you with awe and wonder. Because remember, the way this whole book is shaped, um, we've been climbing towards Alyosha's grand vision, this wedding at Cana. And Mitya, his experience is a dream. And then, as I told you, Yvonne's going to have a nightmare. So these three, shall we call them states of consciousness of each of the brothers, uh, give a perspective to the whole human experience in Dostoevsky's world, which is really a glimpse of what it means to be human and what it means to encounter redemption in our fallen world. So hopefully you're following Dimitri along that path and um, his, his, his magical dream of the babe, which is what we're going to get to. So just kind of setting us up here for book nine. Um, as you read book nine, you probably got frustrated with all the ways that Dimitri seems to be incriminating himself. Um, remember, because Dimitri has had such a bad reputation, and he has committed violent deeds in the past, people tend to then exaggerate things about him. And so that all works together. And this adds to his unfortunate predicament. In many ways, he's brought this upon himself. Um, we do see here in, in Book 9, Grushenka is the very embodiment of redemption. She even ends up claiming responsibility for the crime. She... Uh, sacrifices herself, and she admits that she pitted father against son. Um, Dimitri, though, provides the prosecutor with a history of his attempts to get the 3,000 rubles, and he incriminates himself by telling them about the signals that he and his father and Smerdyakov used. So a very suspenseful chapter. If you remember at the beginning of our series, I mentioned to you that although this is an, a Christian novel of pathos and redemption, it is also a thriller and a mystery. And we very much see that in books 9, and we'll see more in 11 and 12, which leads us to question 1. Um, looking at uh, Dimitri and his state of mind and what's happening um, to, in, inside of himself and his torments, depending on your translation, he is experiencing ordeals and torments. Um, and the way it, Dostoevsky lays it out, he has the first ordeal, the second ordeal, the third ordeal. This particular uh, writing actually echoes orthodox eschatology. Um, in the orthodox understanding of death, after death, the soul ascends heavenward from the earth. Um, but the soul is intercepted by evil spirits who subject it to various trials, 20 in all. And these trials are called mitarstva. And again, I don't claim to be a great Russian speaker, but it means torments of the soul. So Dostoevsky is using liturgical uh, religious language for that. Dmitri's soul is undergoing a series of trials. And at the conclusion of these trials, as you've already begun to see, he emerges as a new, as a, as a new man. But on his way to getting there, he's definitely in a confused state um, and did you notice um, the little hints that Dostoevsky puts in the reading to remind us that Dmitri is still childlike? 
he can't handle things. For example, I think it's kind of amusing how he he cannot concentrate on what the interrogate what the interrogator is saying, but he notices uh, the big rings on his finger. These rings are glittering before him. So kind of an extreme case of ADHD while he's being interrogated. Um, in fact, Dostoevsky writes, this is in chapter three, and long afterwards, he remembered with wonder how those rings had riveted his attention through all those terrible hours of interrogation. And I think we can all relate to that when we've lived through traumatic events and you look back, it is those sort of strange little details like those rings that we remember, and Dostoevsky knows that. So in short, Dimitri's exhausted, and we see him literally holding his head in his hands. Um, in chapter 8, there's that poignant scene where he is looking out the window, you know. Um, so he's definitely going to pass through these trials before he has his beautiful dream. Now, speaking of trials, looking at question number two, it's very important that we understand that Dimitri is being stripped, so to speak, um, literally, but also figuratively, spiritually, metaphorically. What they do to him in terms of his actual clothes is humiliating to him. And if you remember, I've mentioned before, when he was a little boy and he was abandoned, he didn't have, you know, a proper shirt or clean clothes. Uh, Gr Gregory had to do that for him. So whenever he's put in these positions, it's a reminder to him, I would say, of his, his mother, his motherlessness and his feeling of being abandoned and rejected. Rejected. Now, the interrogators humiliate Dimitri, um, not only by being strict, but, but stripped, but doing it in front of other people. That's definitely humiliating for him. And he's further embarrassed because Kalganov loans him clothes that are too tight. So they don't even fit. And this further exacerbates his, um, his sense of a loss of identity. Um, later, we're going to see how Dostoevsky is really making a claim that Dimitri is a Christ figure in these trials because he's being stripped here for a crime he did not commit. And later, we're going to see the presence of vinegar in the court. And it's supposed to remind us of Christ on the cross and the episode um, with the vinegar. Um, when Dimitri talks about this, he says, um, it's like a dream. And this is also reminding us of stripping, kind of a nightmarish quality. And I think Dostoevsky does this on purpose. This is a nightmarish scene that's going to lead up to the beautiful dream of the babe. Um, also, the fact that Dimitri's clothes and underclothes are dirty is also symbolic. Um, just the way that he sees himself or treats himself and how his um, life has unfolded. So um, in looking at how he is treated by the officials, that's going to lead us to questions. Um, I, I thought I would take numbers three and four and look at them together because number three, I asked a question about how the officials behave in the courtroom, which concerns Dostoevsky very much. And also how Dostoevsky is using the mechanical uh, structure of the law court and of the state as something to... Um, compare with, let's say, the spiritual view of the world that Father Zosima had. Dostoevsky is not pleased with the law reforms, and he's drawing a negative picture of that for us right before our very eyes. Um, if you remember back at the beginning of this series, I did a whole discussion on the courts. It might be worth listening to that again if you're really interested in this, because Russia went through extensive Western legal reforms, and this scandalized Dostoevsky. So in these scenes, um, Dostoevsky is painting a portrait of a bifurcation of morality 
and law. And he does this through this new system of trial by jury, which was put into practice in 1866. And I think if we look deeply, it's fascinating. Um, for Dostoevsky, I think the thing that horrified him is he saw it as a new medium of a public scrutiny of interiority. So I feel like he's asking, what right do we have to look into Dimitri's soul? And if we do enter into Dimitri's soul, are we approaching it with awe as someone created in the image and likeness of God? Or are we treating it as raw scientific data? I think it's brilliant how Dostoevsky does this because he's definitely foreshadowing a, a trend that's only gotten much worse since then. He is wondering about the consequences of the public communicability of someone's intentions. Here, through all these questionings, we're trying to get at motives. And Dostoevsky's very concerned with that. The question is not just, did you murder your father? But did you want your father to be murdered? Or did you look the other way? He is going deeper um, at these levels of intention. Um, in the judicial process, um, Dostoevsky is wondering if there's any empathy or narrative. Is a person allowed to tell their story? If you, if you notice, um, when Dimitri tries to explain his side of the story, of course, it's his own fault sometimes. He's, he's put in ridiculous situations, though. He never gets to say his story. It's always cut short with kind of, give me the facts, give me the facts. And, and Dostoevsky is concerned about that. He also is not pleased with an adversarial system that emphasizes verbal combat among the attorneys. Yeah, he, this is not a system that leads to justice uh, for the accused or the victim. So the mystical notion of responsibility um, that Dostoevsky developed in, in the last years of his life um, is incompatible with the rational workings of this legal system where, quote, the punishment fits the crime. Uh, that kind of idea, that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, uh, we have boxes. Dostoevsky did not feel that system allowed for enough of the nuance of crime, interiority, uh, motivation of the individual human person. And uh, we get a close look at um, the interrogator. So here we meet Nikolai Parfenovich Nelyudov. He's the district attorney. He's the investigating lawyer. Um, the way he is introduced and the way things unravel, um, Dostoevsky is trying to discredit the modern and civilized legal practices from the West. And there's a marked contrast between the official's dry, official use of language and Dimitri's heartfelt, marvelously appropriate responses. Did you notice that? Dimitri, he, he has the most amazing responses to these dry questions. And to top it off, he does the sign of the cross three times. You could not have more of a contrast. Um, and the way it's fascinating, I wish I knew Russian, but I don't. But the scholars of the Russian say when the interrogator is speaking, Dostoevsky actually changed um, the structure of the language. There are very long sentences with embedded subordinate clauses, uh, well chosen but bookish words, and smooth grammatical syntax um, that seem very um, robotic compared to Dimitri, who speaks man to man and who avoids all legal jargon. The prosecutor has an unrequited thirst for recognition, and he also has an unreasonable and excessive trust in his own psychological abilities. And he, he actually doesn't know how to read people at all, but he thinks he does. His efficient, petty, and shallow mind is hopelessly below the task of understanding the generous heart of Dmitry Karamazov. 
Um, we also have this theme of fact and fiction. What's a lie? What's a truth? When does the lie become the truth? It, it can be, it's very invigorating reading. Um, it'd be nice to have time to read it again. But um, Dimitri is telling the truth. But it's, 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 it, it can be hard to follow. Um, the way Dimitri seems to be incriminating himself, uh, all the way that happens, just kind of a quick side note. You're not going to be surprised. The way that happens comes from a work by Schiller called The Cranes of Ibibus. Not something I've read, but just I just think it's fascinating how Dostoevsky takes all these different works and, and, and puts them together. Um, and then we also meet Ippolit Kirillovich, um, where Dimitri tells him, yeah, you will need God yourselves. And when you read it, it sounds like he's desperate, but later we're going we're gonna to find out that Dimitri's actually being a prophet. But I won't uh, give, give you a spoiler. The issue of the open door with Gregory, that is definitely something that makes Dimitri look guilty. The door standing wide open. That's the phrase. The whole case hinges on this detail. And I want you to think about it. Um, even though this evidence is false, who gives it? That's right. It is Gregory who gives it. And this is the man that Dimitri struck twice, brutally, although inadvertently and although he feels terrible about it, I think it's fascinating that the person he did attack is the one who is condemning him. Um, also, the way Dostoevsky uses the name of Smerdyakov in this book is magnificent. He has Dmitri saying, quote, I can't get Smerdyakov out of my head. The way that's written is supposed to remind us of Smerdyakov's tormenting presence in Ivan's mind. And the crescendo and how his name appears in the chapter, it's in the foreground, then it recedes into the background, the way it comes in and out is artistically done for a purpose. And as we read book nine, Dimitri, he begins to understand everything. He knows what happened. He starts to figure it out, but the officials do not. And this is definitely a condemnation of modern Russian society that took up Western norms in an irresponsible, shallow way. Um, and you know what's beautiful about it? Through all of the, di the discussions, it's actually Dmitri who understands the monstrosity of killing a father, but the officials do not. It's very interesting. And really, what's Dostoevsky doing? All those radical thinkers that we, we talk about every month, he's putting them on trial. It, it's really magnificent how he does that. Um, also, note this beautiful transformation in Dimitri. In the beginning of the book, Dimitri um, conceives of himself, I would say, in a traditional legal mindset because he repeats, um, I did not kill him. So it's plain and simple, right? I did not kill him. You're accusing me of a crime I did not commit. However, keep reading and it's amazing. What happens? He changes and discovers for himself the elder's testimony of all for all. We're responsible for all. Your sin is my sin. And Dimitri accepts that in his own heart because of the dream. So he moves out of the uh, narrow, closed, legalistic framework to this broad, beautiful uh, Russian concept of solidarity in guilt and solidarity in redemption. It's hard not to think of the little onion, how it all comes together. Which, of course, I'm leading this to question number five, which is the climax of this book, which is The Dream of the Babe. Have you ever read anything more beautiful? Um, and the, again, 
I would draw your attention. I, we don't always see it because it's translated. The way this happens in the book, all of a sudden the chapter changes. I don't know if you noticed. Um, there's a change of pace. It's been very fast and suspenseful. In, in, in the preceding chapters, um, Dimitri's perceptions were in the foreground and we had all this nervous tension. Who takes over now? Did you notice? It is the narrator and he is presenting a new point of view. It's calm, it's relaxed, and it's told in the present tense, not in the past, um, to keep it right before our very eyes. Now, like Alyosha's vision, Dimitri has a dream. And this dream, um, which I'm going to look at now and read it to you, uh, it says he was driving somewhere in the steppes where he had been stationed long ago, and a peasant was driving him in a cart with a pair of horses through snow and sleet. He was cold. It was early in November. By the way, we're filming this early in November, so that's great. It's snowing today. And the snow was falling in big wet flakes, melting as soon as it touched the earth. And the peasant drove him smartly. He had a fair long beard. He was not an old man, somewhere about 50, and he had on a gray peasant smock. Not far off was a village. He could see the black huts, and half the huts were burnt down. They were only the charred beams sticking up. And as they drove in, there was a peasant woman... There were peasant women drawn up along the road, a lot of women, a whole row, all thin and wan with their faces, a sort of brownish color, especially one at the edge, a tall bony woman who looked 40, but might have been only 20 with a long thin face, and in her arms was a little baby crying, and her breasts seemed so dried up that there was not a drop of milk in them. And the child cried and cried and held out its little bare arms with its little fists blue from the cold. Why are they crying? Why are they crying? Mitya asked as they dashed gaily by. It's the babe, answered the driver, the babe weeping. And if you keep reading this, this dream, Dimitri is so full of compassion for the suffering children that he cannot be uh, he cannot just stand by anymore he has to be involved in life and in the quest for helping the children and so and when he wakes up um i think it's beautiful did you notice what's under his head someone put a pillow it says there was a pillow under his head who put that pillow under my head who was so kind he cried with a sort of ecstatic gratitude and tears in his voice as though some great kindness had been shown him he never found out who this kind man was it's so mysterious and beautiful that it almost makes you think an angel put the pillow there but the sheer sense of gift that's there from Dostoevsky is amazing um, because Dimitri cannot put that pillow there himself. It, it was a gift. And that's why um, through this whole series, we have Dimitri pictured with a pillow because it is going to be his own sense of gratitude that's going to change him. So this dream objectifies the transformation that has taken place in his conscious. And it's a result of his own suffering. Now he has a brand new awareness of the wretchedness of others. Now we can't help but compare this to Yvonne. Remember, for Yvonne, the awareness of suffering led to rebellion. But for Dimitri, the awareness brings a desire to throw himself into alleviating the world's miseries instead of increasing their number by giving free reign to his impulses. So now he knows that he's going to have to change his life if he's going to alleviate the suffering in the world. Um, and I think it's brilliant how he does that. Which leads to the next question. Why does Dimitri accept his suffering? Well, um, even though he's tormented by the false accusations because he's had the dream, um, he's willing to accept his punishment because he wanted to kill his father, even though he did not. 
Um, he's innocent of the actual killing, but he realizes his deep guilt. In fact, in his letters, Dostoevsky quoted um, the following proverb about Dmitri. A man won't cross himself until he hears thunder. Because remember, Dimitri says, um, uh, or I think it's the narrator who says it, a thunderbolt has fallen. And so Dostoevsky used an actual Russian proverb for that. Because he has suffered so much, he is open to accepting uh, this change in his heart. Notice also that he says, because all are to blame for all. And, and remember, he never heard of the elder's testimony. He wasn't privy to all that information, but he discovered it on his own. Um, and so once he does accept his suffering and all this is unfolding, uh, Grushenka calls him noble. And we can't help forget, though, that earlier Katarina called him a scoundrel. And I think it's interesting because we're not done with Katerina yet. Um, is he a scoundrel or is he noble? Well, what's the answer? I, of course, Dostoevsky knows the answer. He's both. Uh, this is a literary device. Uh, it's a Dostoevskyan way of using this device, which basically means a character can have contradictory character traits and we know this is grounded in reality because we can see it in ourselves and in others um, but it is uh, beautiful how they both both Grushenka and Dimitri are clearly on their way up on the journey of holiness because both Grushenka and Dimitri publicly declare their faith through in front of everybody and they and they uh, make a sign of the cross and also, I love it. Did you notice Grushenka makes a deep bow to um, Dmitri? And I think what a beautiful way Dostoevsky brings that all together. Because remember, Katerina and Dmitri have false bows. They're masks. They're fake. But the elder bowed to Dmitri at the beginning of the novel because he foresaw that Dmitri was going to endure a great suffering. And it's like Grushenka is saying, bravo, Dimitri, you are being faithful through this. And she bows to him. I love how everything that these characters undergo, the whisper of the elder is there. He is there in their lives. It's so beautiful how Dostoevsky does that. Okay, so that is the exciting way that book nine ends which leads us we're going to move on to book 10 which is totally a different scene right totally lots of different things going on in book 10 we are looking at the boys um, and it can be a little bit jarring to move from all of that going to a different scene here but the boys are very important because they're going to show us how Alyosha has begun to live his new life. He's no longer wearing his clerics. He's wearing regular clothes. He's in the world. He knows it is his job to help the young. And it is the young who are suffering and going the wrong way. And they are doubles of a lot of the characters that we've already met. So, of course, you know that um, I'm talking about uh, Kolia, who is a double of Yvonne. Now, as we go through these, these characters, these boys, um, we are getting close contact with the impoverished and sick Ilusha and his family. It's also expanding our vision of the world of the village through these um, mischievous, youthful, and these cruel antics of Kolia and his friends. Um, and remember, alyosha has been missing for a while. The last we saw him, he was leaving the monastery. Um and uh, we know that he has been trying to reconcile Elusha with his previous enemies and undoing some of the damage. I know it's hard to keep track of everything. Who started all this mess? It was Dimitri by insulting the captain. And that humiliation was too much for the son, Elusha, to bear. So it all goes back to the Karamazovs. Um, by the end of Book 10, Alyosha has successfully reconciled Kolia with Elusha and even made a disciple of the former. Um, so 
Kolia, even though he's naughty, he is a symbol of hope for the future. He is audacious, but he's charismatic. He's idealistic. Um, and I, I think this uh, book 10 is very telling for uh, letting us see that the young in Russia felt they only had two choices, either socialism or Christianity. And this is so important if you if you study your history, you know, all through the 20th century and you look at the Western world, many people felt it was fascism or communism. Which are we going to choose? Uh, people definitely felt um, they had to make a tough decision, maybe the lesser of two evils. It's a little bit different in Russia. And, and Dostoevsky is showing us how these characters felt like they had to choose. Not surprising, we see the entrance of Rakitin. Rakitin is not a good character. He's not a good influence. He has a role here with Kolia. Also, you can see the similarities between Kolia and Ivan. In fact, um, the narrator mentions uh, the train station. Uh, now, this is all that stuff happening at the train station is actually the train station where Ivan left off. And of course, it is the train that worries us because Kolia, you know, lays on the train tracks and everyone thinks of him as this desperate lost character. The train is a symbol of modernity. It's a symbol of 19th century youth having no one to care for them. It's a symbol of the impersonal nature of modern life. So I think it's important. I can't help but think of, um, oh gosh, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, right? It's going to be the train uh, where Anna will meet um, the person she's going to run away with. And it's where she will end her own life out of desperation. Um, the way Kolia speaks about socialism, it's a very fascinating chapter. The smug way he talks are actually Dostoevsky making fun of Chernichevsky. I seem to bring up Chernichevsky every month who wrote What is to be Done, that, that novel about socialist heroes. Now, in this um, look at book 10, and the question I asked you is, how does it relate to themes of the, of the whole book? So... Definitely, there's the theme of socialism. I think it's also interesting what a big um, role the dog has. It's very fascinating um, about the dog. Ilyusha feels terrible about what he did to the dog. Um, but did you notice the way he did that to the dog? It was suggested to him by Smerdyakov. So the evil influence of Smerdyakov in all these lives is a theme that also enters into this. Um, also, the fact that he, you know, he puts a pin in the dog. He's worried that he has killed the dog. He's tormented. He thinks God is punishing him. It is supposed to remind us, if you read carefully, way back in book five, when Ivan is rebelling against suffering, he brings up a story about a boy who has a horrible death. Um, and so this is reminiscent of what the dog did back in book five, these horrible stories. And then uh, Dostoevsky's bringing it right close in close up with these boys. Now, Kolia, besides being a double of Ivan, he's also a fascinating mimic of the Grand Inquisitor. He mimics the Grand Inquisitor in two significant ways. First of all, just like the Grand Inquisitor, this boy uses authority deception and force to mentor all these young boys who look up to him. Um, remember in book five of uh, the, the Grand Inquisitor back then, humanity is represented as looking up to the Grand Inquisitor. And I'm going to read to you from book five uh, because Dostoevsky is linking it to how Kolia treats the boys. He wrote, we shall show them they are feeble. They are only pitiable children. But the happiness of children is the sweetest thing of all. And that should send you a chill. Because the way the Grand Inquisitor says this is demonic. Because listen to the next line. They will grow timid and start to look up to us and huddle close to us in fear 
as chicks to the hen. They will marvel at us and will be awe-stricken before us and will be proud at our being so powerful and clever that we will have been able to subdue such a turbulent flock of thousands of millions. So the disturbing scene of the Grand Inquisitor is playing out with these boys. Um, also, I think it's interesting the way another theme is, I guess we could call it academic questions. For example, there's that question that runs through the whole book. Who founded Troy? Who founded Troy? You know, it's really a mysterious secret for schoolboys, but Colia exploits it and kind of turns it into a scientific exercise. Um, and I think that's important also. It's very important, I think, the way that Colia has bad feelings about classical education. He, he associates Latin and Greek with tyranny and a lack of freedom. This is because in the 1860s and the 1870s, the progressives in Russia were against a classical education. Um, the ridiculous comments about universal history, this terrible way of looking at history, that comes right out of Voltaire. Colia's words um, echo people like Belinsky and Herzen, people I've brought up before. Herzen wrote a famous letter to the Tsar saying, I am a socialist. I am an incurable socialist. So the words coming out of Colia's mouth are those exact words coming from these progressives. Um, and just very quickly, going back to the dog Zhushka, I think that this is also a strange resurrection scene. Um, when Alyusha hurts the dog, when he puts the pin inside of him, did that prick or that pin remind you of anything? Um, it's the nadrev, it's the laceration. So we've, we've studied all these characters that lacerate themselves and we're going to still see more of that. This pin inside the dog is a laceration because the lacerations breed insincerity in human relations. And there is a hint that maybe Colia is being insincere. I'll tell you, I spent a good deal of time studying the experts, I guess, and none of them seem to agree if the dog is actually Zhuchka or Kolia lied. It's hard to tell. Uh, I go back and forth, and I, I think Dostoevsky won't let us know. I think he leaves it open-ended. But he does show us the uncomfortableness of it all because it's like there's a false miracle because Kolia has the dog play dead and only Kolia's word brings him to life. So there's definitely some artificiality there. But whether it is Zhuchka or not, the risen dog is a tangible sign to Ilyusha that his sins can be forgiven. So I think it ends up for the most part being redemptive. Um, we know that Kolia was wrong to delay and to wait so long, but Alyosha reprimands him gently, which is, again, the opposite of the Grand Inquisitor. This is another way the Grand Inquisitor comes in there um, because the Grand Inquisitor, there's nothing gentle about him. Um, and I think uh, Rakuten is more like the Grand Inquisitor in his harsh techniques, which have influenced Kolia, but we're going to, we'll, we, we're led to believe that Alyosha is going to have more of an influence on him, which leads to probably the most important theme in the whole book. And that's the theme of fatherhood, which is really culminating here in book 10. Notice the disturbing role reversals. The mother um, acts like the child. You know, she, um, she wants the particular games and, and, and she wants to be the center of attention. She's not uh, sacrificing herself for her son. Also, the child is worried about his father. Dostoevsky um, is always showing us uh, how there's a breakdown of motherhood and fatherhood and how I guess sometimes the kids have to substitute. I also think um, 
very important in looking how the father-son relationship um, affects Dimitri. If you think about it, Dimitri has physically attacked three fathers. His natural father, his foster father Grigory, and Snegurov, this the captain right here in Book 10, whom he humiliated in front of his son. Uh, make no mistake, the fact that the captain was humiliated in front of his son is Dostoevsky making yet another point about the attack on fathers. So this is a novel about fathers and what has happened to them. Well, Dmitri has hurt three fathers. And uh, a scholar says his guilt is somehow transcendental. His crime is that of assaulting the very concept of fatherhood itself. And of course, the worst father is the murdered father in the novel. And the redemptive father is Father Zosima. So we need Father Zosima to save us from all these destructive father-child patterns. And Alyosha has agreed to take on that task. And then the hope in the novel is, so will these young boys hopefully take on that pass, uh, that path. And so um, Dimitri, he's hurt the three fathers. Did you notice his rebirth is caring for the baby? So now Dimitri is a spiritual father. For Dostoevsky, there's no resurrection without fathers. So even though book 10 ends on a, a note of high pathos, we've got even comic relief, the dog chasing after this, this grand doctor. Um, we have the terrible grief of Ilyusha's father. It should remind us of the peasant women weeping at the beginning of the novel. Remember when Father Zosima quoted from the book of Job. Instead of the book of Job, what do we get here? We get the book of Psalms, Psalm 137. If I forget thee, Jerusalem. There's that haunting question. If I lose my child, how will I love other children? It's a haunt, It's a question that haunted Dostoevsky. So then he gives us a psalm about remembering and forgetting. Here is another prominent theme in book 10, the theme of remembering and forgetting. Remember our villain, our main villain, Fyodor, forgot about his children. And Dostoevsky says the answer is to build up sacred memory. And the way we do that is, well, he's talking about the classroom. He's talking about Latin and Greek. He's also, of course, talking about liturgical traditions in the church. Of course, he's talking about building the family up again. He's also talking about kicking out socialism because that's wiping out sacred memory. But I think it's beautiful in Psalm one. 137, he's also using Jerusalem as a symbol. The way Jerusalem is repeated in the novel and in the psalm, Jerusalem becomes a symbol in and of itself. And in 1868, when his two-month-old daughter died, uh, Sophia, Dostoevsky wrote the following, And now they tell me in consolation that I will have other children. But where is that little individual for whom I dared to say I would have accepted crucifixion, that she might live? So Dostoevsky is not writing this from some safe, faraway place. He experienced the grief and agony of losing his own children, and that's why he can write a novel like this. Okay, So these, this tormented family in Book 10 is connecting us to all of these themes that I just spoke about with you, um, which will lead us to get ready for the last two books in this novel. Books 11 and 12 are the last two, and then there is a, an epilogue. We will cover that next month as we close out the year and um, finish our, our study. So how to get ready for these last two chapters? Well, we have closely examined the crisis of both Dimitri and Alyosha. And now, book 11 is going to reveal to us Ivan's tormented mind. Both Alyosha and Dmitri have followed the path of Father Zosima. Um, Dmitri, you know, again, very convinced of his innocence, will say, 
I'll fight it out with you to the end, and then God will decide. So there's this theme of God deciding. Um, Dimitri's going to let God decide. We know Alyosha let God decide. So each has chosen for God in their own way. However, Ivan, um, he's at a crossroads. We're going to see that in books 11 and 12. What is he going to love? What road will he travel? We're going to see that it leads to a tormented and brilliantly depicted more severe inner breakdown and a total mental collapse. Um, and in the middle of all that, Dostoevsky has been laying the foundation for the entrance of the devil himself in book 11. So I guess this is a somber introduction for those next two books for, for me to get you ready for them. But remember with Dostoevsky, the somber elements always leave the door open to hope. So I will see you next time. Thank you.